Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission is assuring the investing public that all fund management companies are in good stand and there's therefore no cause for alarm. According to the exchange, all investment funds are safe and secured. The SEC recently directed all market operators to use the mark-to-market valuation method in the valuation of investment asset or securities and portfolios in the security sector. The directive is to provide consistency in the valuation of assets and portfolios in the securities industry, as well as protect investors, especially investors of collective investment schemes. There's more in this news desk report. This is coming at a time some investors claim their investments have lost some value. But the SEC says there is no reason to be worried. The current economic situation in the country has largely affected some financial instruments. But the securities industry regulators assure investors that they will enjoy better returns when the economic situation normalizes and improves. SEC recently directed all market operators to use the mark-to-market valuation method in the valuation of investment assets or securities and portfolios in the securities sector. The directive is to provide consistency in the valuation of assets and portfolios in the securities industry, as well as protect investors, especially investors of collective investment schemes. So we'll be speaking to Kise Antonio on this later on. But for now, members of parliament will this week debate the 2023 budget statement presented last week ahead of passage. And the Speaker of Parliament has a warning for government. Alban Bagman says government should not be using sheer bravado to push their way through their revenue measures, but dialogue with the opposition to find a common ground. The Speaker says anything other than this will lead to acrimony and conflict, and conflict which will not augur well for the economy. No government has succeeded in doing what it has pushed through against obvious opposition. Parliament matters, the opposition matters, but ultimately the people matter. And so throughout, whether on democratic or democratic governance, when the red flags are raised and you still insist and try to push through using bravado, you always end up in calamity. And so, again, parliament matters, the opposition matters, and the people. So this rates revision, we need to talk together and agree on it. If not, at the end of the day, you may not succeed in implementing them. Now, the Speaker of Parliament also asked the MPs to put aside their partisan colours and work to fix the economy. Alban Bagwin said the embattled finance minister Ken Oferata has learned a better lesson with MPs within his own party seeking to oust him and a censure motion hanging around his neck. Don't want to go back to the IMF again. The IMF, as we all know, is not the solution. It's just a palliative. In the discussions after the presentation by the resource persons, it should not be said by observers that members are wearing the usual partisan lenses. I expect members to be sensitive to the waning patience and tolerance of Ghanaians and be responsive to the national call to rise up together to salvage the economy. As he sits here, he's learned a better lesson. It's uncommon to come across the members of your own party rise up in parliament against their own minister. It's uncommon. Let's still say in parliament because the minority in parliament are commending government for pulling the brakes on the implementation of a policy which would have made it difficult to import used vehicles. The Ghana Standards Authority was seeking to ban the importation of such vehicles without conformance certificate. The minority said such a policy will price out the poor in owning vehicles and cars. According to ranking member on the Trade and Industry Committee, Emmanuel Kofi Amabua, government has agreed to suspend the implementation of the policy. We've got a letter from the Ghana Standard Authority, and our fears came through that the Ministry of Energy, uh, sorry, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, has basically called for uh, a halt to that announcement because they did not do the proper consultation with the, the mother ministry 
and that uh, the plan by the ministry is to work on a legislation and a long-term plan before this policy is rolled. So clearly, that announcement. Unfortunately, the Ghana Standard Authority has not come back to the public to make the announcement. Again, if you recall, the Bank of Ghana also issued a statement that they are no longer going to support forests for importers. And immediately there were questions being asked. We know that our ultimate objective, and this is what Ghana has been striving for from day one, to make sure that we can add values to the things we have comparative advantage here and stop the importation of almost everything. But the reality is that today almost everything we use in this country is imported. And that is why every government from Kwame Nkrumah with his import substitution strategy has been working to make sure that we can have industries that will produce the critical things that we need. Unfortunately, as we speak today, this government's flagship policy of one district, one factory, if I ask the one critical question, has that been able to really address one problem of the things we import? I mean, can we point to one factory in the last seven years because of 1D1F? We can say that because of this effort by 1D1F, we are no longer importing rice, we are no longer importing poultry, or we, we have even cut it by 25%. There's none. In fact, the imports have increased. And now when you look at the supply disruptions because of what is going around the world, for government to basically make such announcements in the heat, we, we met... Uh, Guta, we met uh, Association of Ghana Industries, and they all talked about three things. The three evils of the city's depreciation, inflation, and quite frankly, high interest rates. Every manufacturing, every business is really on its needs. So can you imagine we complicate it when we have no plan in place in this period where we are in December close to Christmas, and we create a disruption where even the few manufacturing companies that we have in Ghana will not be able to import the necessary inputs in the midst of crisis in the world. So this government must get its art together and coordinate well and make sure that when we are coming out policies, it is policies that will endure to the benefit of the people of Ghana in the long run. It doesn't look like all the things that are happening are, are part of what we are saying. A ranking member on the Roads and Transport Committee governs Kwame Agbaja while commending government for taking this decision, tags officials to dialogue with all stakeholders during the suspension period. Policy. I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Ghana Standards Authority and the Minister of Trade uh, for listening to our position and uh, that is the basis of the 24th uh, uh, November uh, uh, letter saying that that uh, issue has been suspended. We believe once they've done that, let's uh, do the second step. That is go back and do proper consultation with importers, uh, uh, I mean, assemblers of vehicles, and the, those who engage in trading of used vehicles so that we can come up on a prop, uh, appropriate day that we can roll out this. Nobody is against uh, Ghana having the, the, the capacity to assemble vehicles, but I don't think we, we, are, we, are, we are there yet. So now that they have suspended their program based on what we have said, I think they should activate the second step, which is to do the proper consultation so that together we can implement this policy and not hurt any part of our economy which is already uh, struggling. Uh, those that are fit for purpose, the, the modalities you put in place for them to be imported should be there. I have no doubt that the vast majority of vehicles on our roads are vehicles imported into this country as used vehicles. Yes, I agree. So whilst we build our own capacity to import or assemble vehicles here, until that uh, activity leads to a cheaper or relatively cheaper vehicles assembled here, we are not there yet to be able to do that. I don't know how many Ghanaians actually buy uh, uh, brand new vehicles. And as, as far as I'm concerned, this is the worst time to implement that policy. And that is why I want to commend government for heeding to our our uh, advice and, and withdrawing this. Now that they've done that, we shouldn't go to bed and then they raise it next year. Let's start the proper consultation so that the implementation of this policy would inure to government and the citizenry as a, as a, as a whole. You're still watching News Desk on the Joy News channel. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more news. Stay with us. <laughs>
Welcome back from the break. Let, let's return to our earlier story where the Securities and Exchange Commission is assuring the investing public that all fund management companies are in good stand and therefore there is no cause for alarm. According to the exchange, all investment funds are safe and secured. The SEC recently directed all market operators to use the mark to market valuation method in the valuation of our investment assets or securities and portfolios in the security sector. The directive is to provide consistency in the valuation of assets and portfolios in the securities industry, as well as protect investors, especially investors of collective investment schemes. Now, joining us on this particular uh, development is uh, Kise Antonio. He's Vice President, Ghana Securities Industries Association and Managing Director of the Sentinel Asset Management. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Now, what is really happening in the investment space in this country? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think you alluded to the recent SEC directive where fund managers are to price their fixed income investments uh, using current market prices, which is the um, mark to market valuation methodology. Hitherto, fund managers were valuing these investments using what we call a hold. Uh, to maturity methodology. And with that, um, if you buy a bond, you expect to hold that bond to maturity. And then once you get the principal payment, you invest you know, in other bonds. But currently we have a situation where over the last few months, um, investors have inundated these fund management companies with redemption requests. Mm -hmm. um, initially, it was to buy government securities, which were offering higher yields than the fixed income portfolios of these fund management houses. Mm. And then later to buy dollars to basically uh, act as a hedge against the depreciation of the currency. As a result of that, you know, fund managers have, have to go to the market to sell bonds, which they were actually planning on holding to maturity. Now, I think, as you will know, there's an inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rates. Okay, mm -hmm. the monetary policy rate has gone up, I believe, by 11 percentage points in the last few months, and that has led to some of these bonds trading at discounts mm -hmm. of about 40 to 50 percent of their face value. So, once these um, investors uh, are bringing in redemption requests and fund managers are not uh, getting the inflows or let's say the inflows and the coupon payments they're getting from their current holdings. It's not enough basically to service these redemption requests. They have to go to the market to sell some of these bonds they are having. Mm. And in selling some of these bonds because of the redemption, um, the prices, the very depressed prices of these bonds on the market, what is happening now is that you have a situation where some investors or um, a lot of investors are not getting their principles back. So, I mean, unfortunate as it is, uh, this is the situation. And I think it needs to be made clear that it is as a result of, I dare say, um, the challenges we are facing as a nation, the macroeconomic challenges, right? Which it's unprecedented in recent times. And mm -hmm. you know, the president himself has said that we are in a crisis. And what we're facing in the investment management industry is a direct ref reflection of that crisis we are facing as a nation. Okay, so, so help me understand here. Why is it that if anything should happen, if I placed 10,000 because of what is happening, my principal mm -hmm. should rather be affected and, and not my, my interest? In any case, people, when people are investing, they, they feel that the risk factor affects their interest and not their principal. What, what, what is happening now? Well, it's rather unfortunate. Um, the, the issue is, I mean, like I stated, these bond prices are trading at a steep discount to their face value. And that is why we have the situation we have at the moment, you know, um, if I buy paper, which is offering 20%, mm -hmm. right? And um, let's say um, the discounts, um, have, you're forcing me to sell a bond. 
is at 45 percent mm. obviously it is going to erode uh, that principle you invested with me and that is just what is happening really why should that be my issue and not the investment company finding ways to ensure that my my principal is protected okay look the fund management companies you know um look when it comes to investing there are various levels of risk mm. okay uh, we all know that money market instruments which are instruments uh, with um, tenors or um, periods to maturity less than 12 months being the safest but i mean we've even looked in jurisdictions like the U.S., where they have money market funds, which are touted to be the safest investments when it comes to collective investment schemes. You know, during the global financial crisis and even during the COVID pandemic, um, they, they had losses, okay? Because certain instruments uh, or certain issuers defaulted on certain instruments, albeit the fact that these issuers were maybe triple uh, A credit rated or what? You see, the main thing is investing risk always lies with investors. You see, the fund managers, based on your investment objectives, your risk tolerance level, and the tenor, you know, your investment horizon, the period at which you're looking to you know, generate returns. Maybe you want to save for your kids to go to university or you want to buy a car four years down the line. They direct you to what best meets this, um, you, that investment objective of yours. Mm. But it is always the investor that carries the investing risk. You see, the fund manager has a fiduciary responsibility and I don't want to use too many jargons, but the fiduciary responsibility is to treat that customer with that standard of care as if they were investing their own money okay so we currently have a situation and i don't want to sound like a broken record but because of the challenges we've had that has led to the depression of these prices which unfortunately investors have to carry i mean if i'm to use an analogy and to stretch it a, a bit Let's forget about fixed income. If I were to buy, let's assume multimedia was listed, yeah, and I buy shares of multimedia, and these shares of multimedia go down, are less than the purchase price, it is you who are going to carry the risk, not the investment mm. manage, uh, manager. Okay. And there's nowhere in the world where the investment manager takes um, the losses of, on behalf of the investor. Mm. So I think, look, this has created a situation where all actors in the ecosystem, whether it's investors, and look, if investors are to read the fine print in the prospectuses and uh, fact sheets of these, um, of these products, mm. they will always say that past performance is no indicator of future returns. Okay. And there's also the mention of the risk that you might not get your principal, you invested. Okay. You know, so I think this is a time for fund managers to also explain adequately the downside risks of investments to investors and also for investors to also take, read, understand what they're doing. Okay. So that, right. you know, we don't have what we, the situation currently. Okay. Have. So that, finally, in the situation we find ourselves, are we saying that if investors take their time and not rush to withdraw, we can get out of this situation and still have access to the full of, exactly. of their principles. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Okay. All right. I'm grateful to you, sir, for joining us. Uh, that uh, Kise, Thank you so much, uh, um, Antonio, he is vice president for the Ghana, uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, the Ghana uh, Securities in Industry Association there, Kise. Antonio Grateful. Now, John, not his real name, was just a boy when his own father sold him to three boat owners on Lake Volta. His masters forced him to engage in hazardous fishing activities, but he managed to escape and is now in class six and already on the path to becoming a professional footballer 
as he hopes to represent Ghana at the World Cup. Maxwell Agbaba went to visit him in an island community in the northern region in our report. I am in a canoe heading to an island community in the northern region to meet John and his mother. When John was a boy, his father took him from their family house at Dodoa and trafficked him to a fishing community called Esoso, close to Hausa Kope in the Pru district. His father allegedly took money from three boat owners. His mother tells me John's father came for him under the guise of getting him to start school, but rather sold him to some fishermen on Lake Vota. About four months ago, I heard my son was engaged in dangerous fishing activities on Lake Vota. I cried. I was determined to find it. I really suffered to take care of him. I sold some of my personal possessions just to take care of him. I bumped into my son at Yeji. It was unexpected and I am grateful to God. I am grateful to God. He became very sick. He was beaten by the boatmasters and that affected his health. They beat him with their paddles when he's unable to dive into the water to untangle a net. My boy, he was always crying and complaining of waist pains and his abdomen. I couldn't eat. John's duties included but were not limited to scooping water from the boats and diving into Lake Vota to untangle fishing nets. He was forced to work on the lake from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and continue at midnight and return at 5 a.m. every day. He was physically abused, starved and neglected. John was not one of the lucky few children rescued by the Ghana Police Service. He fled from his third boatmaster. I'm now at John's school on the island where a class is in session in a dilapidated structure made of mud. Now John no longer has to go fishing during school hours. He says he's determined to complete his education and pursue a career in professional football and hopefully represent Ghana at the World Cup. He's optimistic he will make enough money to build a new school to replace the rundown structure in his community. My friend Casimero. 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 We were from here FC. Familiar. On the field, my friends call me Casimero. I play for Family FC. I will develop the community and provide them with electricity and a better school building. I know I can do it. Our school building is dilapidated and we are unable to do proper studies yet. When the sun starts shining, we have to close. The head teacher here at John's okay, school says all attempts to get authorities to fix the dilapidated school structure okay, have proven futile. He's hopeful John, whom he describes as generous, will help change the story of the community. He's kind. Yeah. He's, so, he's good to us. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about football aspect, he's one of our key players mm. in, the, in, in the school. And you also show due respect to the teachers. I think the issue of uh, child trafficking has been a, a worrying situation to almost all. I've now met Godwin Awudi. Uh, He's assembly the member for the Yeji Traditional Council uh, Electoral Area. 31 children were rescued at the Yeji uh, in, in the first quarter of 2021. His assembly is working hard to ensure more children are rescued from fishermen and boat owners who are using them for hazardous work on Lake Vota. Oh yeah, a lot of stories have come up. You know, our place happened to be a fishing community. And of course, when you have a fishing community, uh, you should be thinking of uh, trafficking. Our place here happened to be uh, a destination. You know, in terms of child trafficking, we have the source community and then the destination community. 
Yeji, as it stands now, is noted as a destination community. So there have been issues of uh, child trafficking in the area. Uh, we need to distinguish trafficking and labor in these regards. You know, trafficking has to do with uh, uh, exchanging the child for a fee. That is, when there is a payment, maybe the child is going to work for some number of years, and then whoever is giving the child out is going to receive an amount. Mm. Then you have an issue of trafficking. So when there is a transport, then you have issue of trafficking. Now with the labor, we are talking about what type of work the child does. So if the child is doing the work that does not suit the age, then we are referring to labor. Of course, if you look at these distinguished uh, features of labor and trafficking, yes, along the area here, we may come across some of those issues because we are in a fishing community. In the fishing community, you know, most of the time people use the children to do fishing. I must say, before the sensitization programs, a lot of people are actually ignorant about the whole issue. That is why when you meet uh, somebody who is involved in this, he asks you, oh, what of if I'm using my own child to work? So it means such a person, they might not be trafficking, but there, is, there might be labor. John's story today is a far cry from his early years when he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, behavior disorder, and severe malnutrition. Regular psychological counseling and a nutritionist at Tamale Teaching Hospital have helped to, to turn his life around. His story mirrors what many children continue to face on Lake Volta. Well, uh, Leo Akun is the public campaign against human trafficking, and he joins us on Zoom with more. Leo, grateful that you could join us. Will you agree with me that this strategy is directly from the playbook of the traffickers? Many of them first come promising your, child, your child's education will be looked at and then end up selling them to boat masters who use them for hazardous fishing activities. What are other plans uh, do they use and uh, what are some of the red flags we should be looking out for? I think that uh, what you just highlighted is exactly what they do. And basically, um, the story we just, um, I mean, watched and listened to basically depicts uh, many of the uh, tricks that uh, board masters actually use in um, exploited children on, on the water lake. And, and I think that for the red flags, the Human Trafficking Act makes it clear uh, what constitutes trafficking and what uh, really um goes into what it means for somebody to be trafficked and basically the harboring and exploitation of children clearly is um, one of the main things that you would see that these board masters use in exploiting children and the promises of taking these kids to school um another guys of um they helping the parent to take care for the child is often uh, what they use so many a time there is um, a deliberate intention many many of the board masters are aware and they use these deliberate intentions under the guise of helping these children and then get to traffic them. The second thing is that many a time some of these parents are aware they deliberately uh, sell out their children to these board masters uh, for the purpose of getting money uh, from them. So um, I, I would say that there is deception, but also in many cases also uh, this is from consent. Uh, from parents um, who basically um, sell out their children to board masters. Okay. Now, as you heard from the assembly member of EAG electoral area there, some people are ignorant about when they have crossed into the red line of trafficking and child labor. C can you share with us the point at which it becomes trafficking and child labor? Yeah, like I said earlier on, the law is very clear uh, that once there is uh, the recruitment, there is harboring, there is transportation, um, of an individual, of a child, mm -hmm. uh, for the purposes of exploitation, um, that is an offense, that is a criminal offense, that is child trafficking. So the law um, is very clear, the Human Trafficking Act um, of 2005 is very clear on this. Now, many, many uh, board masters, when they are caught or when they are arrested by the police, uh, feign ignorance, and, and that's true. But um, if you look at the dynamics, you would realize that um, many of them are actually aware that what you're doing is a crime. And I can give you an example. Um, um, we, we did some work uh, with uh, the Yeji police and Yeji social welfare. 
and yet is somewhat 2019 where um, over 900 uh, fishermen and, and fishmongers gathered together for them to be sensitized on the dangers of, of shark trafficking and what elements are. And, and I can tell you that out of these 900 uh, boatmasters and fishmongers um, that participated, all of them were educated. Now, they were given an opportunity to surrender, they were given an opportunity to stop the act of exploiting children. And I can tell you that none of them owned up. So the point is that they are very much aware. But from that time, 2019, many of these same people that participated in this sensitization training have been arrested uh, by the police were engaging in the same um, exploitation of children that mm. uh, originally they were given the opportunity to surrender children that they didn't. So um, it's just a way of getting around the law. It's just a way of um, being able to escape from uh, prosecution. And that's why it's say they are ignorant about uh, their actions. Many of them, I can tell you that many of them are very much, because a lot of sensitization has, has been done. And aside that, the dynamics has also changed in the league where many of them have moved that way into inter areas where it is very difficult to actually see them. And, and, and because they know that the police is coming after them, they're not going to places which are very difficult uh, to reach, um, especially for police officers. So they are aware, and so their models of operandi are changing as well day in and day out. Can we say we are winning? If not, what is accounting for our inability to win this fight? And what must change about our effort for us to win this, this fight against child trafficking on, on, on the water lake? I would say that um, Ghana as a country, we are making a lot of um, effort. Our efforts, over the years, there's been a lot of progress with regards to our efforts. And um, if you look at the, uh, the tip report, which is the trafficking and passes report that was released uh, this year, the 2022 report, it states that um, about 727 uh, victims were rescued um, in the year 2021. Uh, as compared to what uh, the numbers are in the year uh, 2020, um, just about 391 were rescued. So you could see um, an improvement from the year 2021 uh, and 2020, you could see that improvement. Now in 2020, uh, 2022 as well, the budget, uh, there's been an improvement in terms of the amount that was allocated into the human trafficking act, into the human trafficking fund. Although that amount is woefully not where which is two million, it doubled from one million uh, in the year before to two million in, in 2022, which is an improvement. So this is just to say that we are making some progress. There is a lot of progress being uh, made at this level, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. I, I can give you an example. For instance, mm. Ghana only has one adult uh, shelter uh, for victims of human trafficking, uh, which is woefully inadequate. In, in terms of shelters for um, children who have survived human trafficking, uh, it's very woefully inadequate. The government's own shelter uh, can't really care for many children. And it's just based here in Accra. Uh, if you go to other parts of the countries, we don't have enough shelters. Uh, but I, I believe that we need to really uh, put where uh, the resources are needed. If you go to the many districts, the local areas, the social welfare department are very much in the resource. The police in those areas are also very much in the resource. So I think okay. there's a lot more we can do and mm -hmm. we can end this problem if okay. we really uh, put all our acts together. All right. Leo Akon, I'm grateful that you could join us. Uh, he is Thank a campaigner you. against child uh, trafficking. And that's, uh, we'll take a break here. We'll bring you business after we'll stay with us. Hi, welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwal. Government says it has no plans to abruptly abandon the exploration of oil and gas resources, citing them as vital to the economy. According to Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya, government plans to progressively wean Ghana off its reliance on fossil fuels by speeding up the development of renewable energy sources. He was speaking on behalf of President Ekufado at the 2022 Ghana Energy Awards. And Dr. Bamiya, the event said government will continue to make the necessary strategic investment in clean energy and green technology whilst striking an important balance with hydrocarbon assets to ensure they are not stranded. The critical concern for the sector in our country still exists. That is the continuous exploitation of our hydrocarbon assets. Let me be quick to emphasize 
that government does not plan to abruptly abandon the um, exploitation of our oil and gas resources as they are critical to our economy. Instead, government intends to gradually win win Ghana of dependence on fossil fuel through the acceleration of and the rollout of renewables. The passage of the Renewable Energy Master Plan 2019 and the sustainable use of natural resources and energy financing in 2021 attest to our commitment in this direction. Chairman at the Oil and Gas Sector of the Association of Ghana Industries, Kwame Jantua, called for diversity within the sector. You know, there are two sides of energy. There's the petroleum side and there's the power side. And both sides contribute to climatic change because of fossil fuels and the generation of electricity. Now, on the generation of electricity, we are talking about renewable. That's where the transition comes in. But I think Ghana sits in a very opportune place. We've now discovered lithium, and we can turn our crude into materials for electric cars. The lithium, we can do batteries. So it depends on how we plan it going forward. I think we're in a, we're in a very good position to be able to supply the renewable energy sector with good materials, especially electric cars. And then you look at the hydro gas situation and the renewables, the solar. The Ghana Energy Awards aims to recognize the efforts, innovations and excellence of stalwarts in the sector. The award scheme further seeks to celebrate the tremendous work of competing players under the various award categories. Now, Executive Director of Enterprise Bureau, FL and Kumlaga, is urging the youth to venture into entrepreneurship and create businesses to increase their income. She made the call during the launch of an investment book titled uh, Sikam Pedidi. Here's more. The Sikam Pedidi book is an investment guide that will aid the average Ghanaian to make good financial decisions and provides insights into viable investment opportunities that people can opt for. Speaking at the launch of the book, the Executive Director of Enterprise Bureau, Ethel Anikomlaga, said it is important for people to acquire skills that would help them set up profitable businesses. And if it is okay for us to consider re-education, by re-education we divert into skills and whatever um, degree one has acquired, it is right for one to acquire a skill, a skill as well. And I think that is why we were gathered to talk about all the, um, the issues about entrepreneurship and also funding and how to be aligned for funding opportunities. To be an entrepreneur, I think I mentioned that everyone is an entrepreneur in one way or the other identifying a problem and solving it um, personally or in an organization. So just to be able to scale it, you have to look at your, your belief system, what you are aligned with. By my presentation, I talked about craftspeople, the mountain climbers, and the freedom fighters. You have to be able to know what you are good at, and then you build your profile accordingly. Author of the book, Sikam Pedede. Peter Asari Nyako added that it is important to plan for emergency expenditures when making a budget. In planning your major expenditures, uh, one thing you need to do is to come out to the budget. And in your budget, you should have an item for emergencies. Emergencies. So in case something happens out of the blue, you know that you have made provisions for it in your emergencies, so you use that amount to cover any emergencies that will occur. All right, and that's it for business. There's more coming up after this break. An intense game ahead as Ghana meets South Korea. We have discussions coming up right after this. the break now an intense game ahead as Ghana meets South Korea in their second World Cup game at Education City Stadium in Qatar here in Accra many Ghanaians are optimistic that the Black Stars are going to come out victorious my colleague Mapito Sibidi uh, spoke to some of them I'm 
Uh, yeah, mm, actually, our boys are now serious to play the match. And the, I think if we, we allow we allow the coach to bring in the right people to play, I think Ghana is going to win. Yeah. Actually, we need we need to we need to start with the uh, uh, good and attacking attackers, which are uh, who can stand the fit. The fit and strong players who are right to play. Yeah. The Blaster win training for Ghana today. And then what's your score prediction? I think if we have a good day, we are going to score them too. Well, I'm expecting Ghana to win today because we really need this. If not, we'll be out of the competition. So can you give me a scoreline prediction? Oh, it should be a win for us. Um, my expectation is very high, very high moral. Because I'm very confident with our team, what we have done last time. So I'm very comfortable, at least 3-0. Yeah. Can you uh, predict who might score those, those goals? Uh, those goals will come from any angle. Because if you look at, um, it depends on the coach how he's going to select. Because I don't know the first 11 at the moment. But I'm very comfortable about Kudus Mohamed can score. And I used to have a big chance if he will play for more than 45 minutes. Uh, today our expectation is very high. Yeah. We're supposed to win this match and qualify to the next stage. No matter how it is, today we are going to win South Korea. But the coach have to do one or two changes in our team, especially. Baba Man is a very good player. But let the coach drop him, like, maybe first half and start Gideon Mensa on the left side. And maybe Salusu, four and five. Then use Amata, because today match, we need a player who can tackle very well. So if he starts... Maybe a free banner, a free banner. Yeah, yeah, but today's, today's match is a must win. So at all costs, we have to win. So who do I should go to other stars? I'm expecting a Kudus and a Neki William to start the game. Black Stars fan hopeful for a win after a stellar performance by the boys against Portugal. Black Stars will meet South Korea and this will be the 10th meeting in all of the competitions. Ghana being ranked the lowest team in the tournament surprised the Portuguese last week. Will they do the same to the South Koreans? Well, we'll wait and see. You can follow us on all our platforms for live commentary on Joy 99.7 FM. So let's bring in uh, Joel Bote of Joy Sports, who is joining me in the studio now. Joel, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. Yeah. What are we breaking from camp? Um, from camp, it looks like there's a lot of confidence within the squad. It looks like the players are motivated, knowing that they were able to perform against a side like Portugal, mm -hmm. um, which many people said was the most difficult fixture, knowing that you have the likes of Ronaldo, Bernardo Silva, and more in that team. And you're going against a, a South Korean side, and you know you definitely need a victory. So this game being pivotal, they know that they do have to get the result. Mm. But South Korea looks like a side that has a lot of strength. Yeah. Um, do we know the strategy we can use to outwit them? Have we picked anything from the strategy we're going to go into this match with? So, um, a lot of uh, speculations out there are saying, especially from sources within the camp or close to camp, are saying there's likely to be changes within the, our, our full backs or wing back setup. And it's likely we may see Tariq Lamte and Gideon Mensa uh, take positions in those areas. Um, for now, that is what we know, but I believe with these two coming in, it brings a lot of um, attacking output to the Black Stars, which we, we wanted in the game against Portugal. Mm. Unfortunately, we didn't get. But I believe that this game, and knowing Ghana's record uh, in their second games, they've actually not lost uh, their second group game in the World Cup. If you look at 2006, between Czech Republic, 2010, drawing against Australia, and also, um, 2014, where they had that major uh, uh, output Problem. against um, Germany, having that 2 2 draw. Um, I believe Ghana will go into this game knowing that once they are able to identify that look, we can attack behind um, the South Koreans, they are full backs and they are wide, they are wide men. We can definitely get a result. In our game against Portugal, you realize that when we changed to 2 2, that's when we got a chance to score because you know, when the, the guys were playing, you realize the captain asked. Inaki yeah. to play with someone up uh, to, to what's, what, are we maintaining one uh, strike up front or we are going to go into this game with two tops? Uh, for now, I believe we may go with a two top mm. because I think the coach has noticed that once you give 
the captain the chance to be up front. What he does is he gives you output. The day is known for his out output. He's very passionate and he's someone that definitely knows how to lead. So if you leave him there and surround him with the right men, especially with the likes of Inaki, who is good at making the runs, you can definitely get a result out or something or an output coming out from our captain out there. Um, so for, for now, I think that, that we may maintain a two-top up front, mm. but it depends. As the game goes, we may see changes okay. in, in the formation. What's your prediction? Um, I'm going for Ghana to win 3-0. 3-0. Okay. Very confident. Uh, well, Cameroon is now trailing uh, a goal to two. Uh, they are, they are, in a, um, they are, they are, they are facing Serbia, Serbia and yeah. Serbia has... Uh, they, they went in the lead and then Serbia equalised and now is in the lead against Cameroon. Uh, there's more news on myjoyonline.com. My name is Samuel Kojo. Please do enjoy the rest of our programs. Have a good morning. Thank you.